This is John J. Miller of National Review Online. Thanks for listening. Our guest is Ralph Reed, author of Awakening, How America Can Turn from Economic and Moral Destruction Back to Greatness. Ralph, how do we get back to greatness? Well, you know, John, it's a, it's a great question, and, and I guess some people would question if we've fallen from greatness, and I'm really talking about not just the economic problems of, um, you know, low labor force participation, $17 trillion national debt, uh, sluggish, really almost European Union levels of, e- of economic growth in the, in the 1% to 2% range, but I'm also talking about 40% of all the children born in America today are born out of wedlock, 73% of the African-American community, marriage under attack, not only from the redefinition of marriage, but also uh, from no-fault divorce and the delay of marriage. Our fertility rate is, is falling, but for immigration, we would be a net loser of population right now. And, uh, you know, I'm also talking about, uh, you know, just things like the legalization of drugs in places like Colorado and Washington State and others. And I think the answer is we're past the point where you can really fix what is afflicting our country um, based on throwing the bums out and electing new people or repealing Obamacare and passing new laws. I think what we need is a change in the moral sentiment a change in the tone and tenor of the culture, which historically only comes about as a result of a moral and a spiritual awakening. Now, the word awakening, obviously, is the, is the title of your book. It also brings to mind the Great Awakening. Uh, you know, the, and there have been several in American history, I guess, starting with Jonathan Edwards uh, way back in the olden times. Um, um, is that your inspiration, the, 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 the Great Awakenings in, in American history? Uh, yes, it is, and I, I think it, it occurs in different forms at different times, and there, John, as I'm sure you're aware, there's some debate among historians about exactly what constitutes an awakening, because a lot of times you're dealing with anecdotal information. Uh, Robert W. Fogel argued in a book in 2000 that there was a fourth great awakening that took place in 19, between 1975 and 2000, where the membership of of evangelical and more devoted denominations doubled and the membership of so-called mainline denominations declined. You also had the rise of the electronic church. Viewers of religious and Christian programming multiplied fivefold from about 5 million in 1970 to about 25 million by the late 1980s. Uh, you had a return to orthodoxy by the Southern Baptist Convention, the largest Protestant denomination in the country. You had the election of John Paul II as uh, the first non-Italian pontiff in over 400 years and really moved the Catholic Church in a more orthodox direction. So I would basically, John, I would argue that even though I know the conventional wisdom is that we live in a postmodern, post-Christian world, I think these kinds of religious and spiritual awakenings have occurred episodically. I even argue in the book cyclically. It's happened before. It can, and I believe it will happen again. So this next awakening, would it be a brand new awakening, or would it simply continue the awakening you just described? Would it just build upon the movement you just described? I think it's brand new. I make the argument in the book that if there was a fourth great awakening, and and forgive the term, but I'm a bit of an agnostic about that, I think that will ultimately be decided by historians after me, um, especially since I was a participant in it. Um, But I think that uh, they were reacting very adversely and recoiling at what they saw as the cultural wreckage of the sexual revolution. And Billy Graham talked about that. That's in the book. Uh, I talk about Christian leaders like Norman Vincent Peale. This next awakening that I believe can and will come will be very different because I think, I think now the reaction will not be to the sexual revolution, which at this point is ancient history for them, but more of a loss of meaning that has come about as a result of a breakdown in marriage 
and family and these enduring cultural institutions of marriage, family, and church that have historically given a meaning and a purpose to people's lives. And if you look at the data, John, even the millennials who say they're not religious and are put in the category of the so-called nuns, that is to say they, they don't profess any kind of religious affiliation, they say they believe in God overwhelmingly, many of them pray regularly, they clearly have a deep and abiding spiritual hunger. Now, does this next awakening, does it have to be Christian, or can it be merely spiritual, or, or could it even be secular in some fashion? Well, I, I suppose it could be whatever form it takes, and I'm not a prophet, but historically, it almost always takes two pretty dramatic forms. One is a return to orthodoxy, which in the case of Christians means a return to a literal reading of the Bible, a belief that the Bible is the Word of God. Now, you have a doctoral debate about so-called inerrancy, is the Bible without error, literally. Um, I come down on one side in that debate, but apart from that, the idea that what is contained in the Bible is true in all of its essential elements and that it is the Word of God. So there is a return to those beliefs, to those practices, and to those doctrines. The second thing, and this is in many ways the most important, but it flows from the first, is you see a dramatic change in personal conversion and personal behavior. In the case of particularly the Second Great Awakening, you had people who gave up alcohol, who gave up gambling. Uh, there was a temperance movement that was birthed out of it. It always has a political repercussion, but it's changed belief which leads to changed behavior, which shifts the culture, and then affects politics. Now let's talk about politics for a moment. I know you at the start of this conversation you said that the next awakening is maybe beyond the reach of politics, but you, of course, are, 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 a, are a political advisor. You're very interested in elections and so forth. What do conservatives and Republicans need to do this year in 2014 as we approach the midterms and then looking toward 2016? Well, I, I think they, they really need to do three things simultaneously, so they're going to have to multitask to achieve the full opportunity that is in front of them, which is to add seats in the House, to gain control of the U.S. Senate, and to begin laying the predicate for a presidential candidate in 2016. Number one, they have to offer, uh, offer an unflinching, unapologetic critique of the failed policies of this administration. They're going to get attacked for it, but whether it's the failure in Ukraine or in the Middle East or Obamacare, they, they have to offer a philosophically sound explanation for why these policies have failed. The second thing they've got to do is they've got to offer a compelling and bold alternative. It isn't just enough to say, if we are given a majority, we'll repeal Obamacare, because people will want to know what's your replacement. And I know there's a debate about that, but mark me down, John, as thinking that as would Newt Gingrich in the, you know, the revolution of 1994 and the contract with America, you've got to have a blueprint for where you're going to take the country. You can't just say what you're against. You have to say what you're for. And then the third thing, and this is, this is really critical, particularly because of the changing demographics of our society. You've got to hang a welcome sign outside your movement or your party and make it clear that people of different ethnic backgrounds, people of, uh, uh, of all uh, types are welcome, even if they haven't always felt welcome. That's particularly true of Hispanics and young people, but it also needs to be true of, of women and African Americans and others. The author is Ralph Reed. The book is Awakening, How America Can Turn from Economic and Moral Destruction Back to Greatness. Thanks for listening. This is John J. Miller of National Review Online. Thanks for listening. Our guest is Stephen Smith, author of The Rise and Decline of American Religious Freedom. Steve, is religious freedom in danger today? I think that religious freedom today is more vulnerable than it has been probably at any time in our recent history. 
Uh, and why is that? For a number of reasons. I mean, uh, uh, obviously it depends on how you look at things and how you understand religious freedom. But I would say that, uh, um, uh, and I, of course I'm not alone in perceiving this. I think a lot of people are a little, um, a little worried about things. And I would say uh, it's the result of various factors, but I would sort of stress two in particular. Um, one is that I think a religious freedom, as we've understood it in this country, has been the product of essentially a Christian heritage and theistic rationales. That's really clear, and I think most scholars will admit that, that if you go back into the founding period and before that, the arguments for religious freedom were largely, or to, to an, an important extent at least, based on theological rationales. The modern problem has been that religious freedom has come to be understood to mean that government is supposed to be secular, and that theological rationales are therefore not admissible. And so in a sense, what's happened is that commitment to religious freedom, as it's been understood, has cut the ground out from underneath itself. It sort of deprived itself of um, being able to rely upon the rationales that supported it. Um, a good uh, a sort of a, a quick way to notice this would be to notice that Jefferson's Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom which has been celebrated, justly so, in our history, and is arguably the kind of seminal legal foundation of religious freedom in this country, begins by declaring, Almighty God hath created the mind free. And then it goes on to say that coercion in religion is a departure from the plan of the holy author of our religion, who being Lord both of body and mind, yet chose not to propagate it by coercions on either. Well, under current Supreme Court doctrine, that would be, I, I would think, a very clear endorsement of religion, and hence, in principle, unconstitutional. And so, in a sense, religious freedom has rendered gender, um, as we've come to understand it, has rendered Jefferson's bill unconstitutional. But that's just one way of, of sort of appreciating that development. That, I think, leaves religious freedom somewhat vulnerable, but it's still got inertia, it's still got tradition, it's surely got a lot of support in our political system. So the other development that I think has um, come to pose a problem has been the development of a very strong movement, you can call it different things, but call it uh, secular egalitarianism, or anti strong commitments to anti-discrimination as it's come to be understood in various respects. And the current frontline issue, I suppose, is same-sex marriage, but that's not necessarily the only thing. Um, and these things tend to clash. Anti-discrimination increasingly, I think, is understood that, you know, discrimination, or let's put it this way, special treatment of religion is a kind of discrimination. As Doug Laycott puts it, it's viewed by many people now as a kind of special interest legislation, and um, that's um, viewed as being inconsistent with equality. So when you put these two things together, I think it does leave religious freedom more vulnerable than it has been uh, at, at earlier points in our history. So what's the connection between religious freedom and freedom in general? Why should someone who is a secular egalitarian care about religious freedom? Well, um, I think there are reasons why even a secular person or a secular egalitarian should care about religious freedom, but they're somewhat complicated. I mean, uh, um, an argument that I only hint at towards the end of the book, I don't... The, it isn't really the point of the book to develop the argument at length, but it would be that not only historically, but in a certain sense, practically and conceptually, religious freedom may be one of the foundations of freedom in general. Madison certainly said that in his famous memorial and remonstrance. At the end, he said, you know, if this freedom is not secure, all other freedoms are in jeopardy as well. I think that um, both in sort of theoretical terms or in historical terms, that's a view that could be supported, and if it's right, then everybody's about religious freedom. But if you don't look at it that way, if you just look at it in a more, well, I would guess I would say straightforward, simplistic way, um, there isn't probably a very good answer to you. So, you know, everybody gets freedom of speech. And this is an increasingly popular view, by the way, among theorists and scholars, I think. As long as everybody has freedom of speech and due process and freedom of assembly, there just isn't any good reason to single out religion for any sort of special treatment, and so religious freedom comes to seem suspect. 
Some people might say, Professor Smith, you've got it all wrong. You've got the problem backwards. That the real threat to religious freedom comes from the religious right, which wants to push its own particular views on the rest of the population. Is that true? <laughs> that, uh, some people definitely would say that. Um, the way I have actually set up this book is in terms of what I call in the introduction the standard story of religious freedom, which I think is it's told that's a simplification. It's told in lots of different ways, but I think there's a sort of standard version or story about religious freedom, and I'm trying to present what I, I call the revised version of religious freedom. But uh, the last chapter of the standard story, I think, is exactly what you've described. You know, that religious freedom is under threat, and it's under threat from Christians or religious conservatives. Um, and my argument is that the threat is real, but the, the account is backwards. The revised version suggests that the threat comes from the other direction. So how did we get to this point? How did we get from the First Amendment and its promise of freedom of religion to now with a White House that has tried to force the, the Little Sisters of the Poor, a Catholic charity, to pay for birth control pills. How did, how did that happen? Well, it's, of course, a long process. Uh, there just, uh, maybe I'd mention two or three points in response to your question. One is I would, um, my revised version would disagree somewhat with the standard characterization of the First Amendment as being the source of these commitments. I think the First Amendment was, in its original purpose and understanding, basically just a jurisdictional device that did nothing more than say um, religion will continue to be within the jurisdiction of the states as it has always been. So I think the commitment doesn't really come from the First Amendment itself, but from our broader history and uh, ongoing tradition and so forth. That tradition, though, I think did evolve into something that I call the American settlement that was a, a distinctive arrangement for that involved a commitment to religious freedom. And at the core of that settlement, I think, was what I call uh, a principle of contestation, or uh, basically the, the, the idea is this that there have always, throughout American history, been people who have given a largely secularist interpretation to the republic, and there have always been people who have given a more providentialist interpretation to it. And there are prominent figures on both sides. And on, the, on the providentialist side, you have people like Washington and Adams and Lincoln and others. But people like Madison and Jefferson tend more to the secular side. The distinctive American contribution, I argue, was to not choose either one of those, either one of those versions as the official version, but rather to adopt a sort of principle in which both sides were assured a continuing place at the constitutional table. Um, so in some places and at some times, a secularist interpretation would tend to dominate. At other times, a more providentialist interpretation would tend to dominate, but neither would be permitted to uh, be given the role as the orthodoxy or the constitutional position. I argue in the book that the Supreme Court, when it became involved in this area in a fairly intensive way, beginning, I would argue, more with the school prayer decisions in the early 1960s than with Everson against Board of Education in 1947, uh, the Supreme Court, in effect, elevated the secularist interpretation to the official constitutional doctrine and relegated the providentialist interpretation to more or less the role of a kind of heresy, uh, constitutional heresy. That, I think, undid the, the American settlement. It was never fortunately done in any very thoroughgoing or consistent way, so I, I don't want to overstate you know, that it, that it uh, eradicated the American settlement altogether, but it did tend to cause the settlement to unravel. And a lot of what we've seen in the way of culture wars and um, since then has been, I, I argue, the result of that discarding of the American settlement. Um, then when you add in the anti-discrimination and egalitarian movement, you basically get us to where, where we are today, I think. Last question. We've got about a minute. What should a person who cares about religious freedom do today? Uh, suppose, suppose, suppose the listener should buy your book and read it. But what else? What else could someone do right now to help 
preserve religious freedom in the United States in the 21st century? Well, I guess I think people do need to inform themselves about the history and the underpinnings of our uh, of our commitment to religious freedom. So uh, my book is one thing that tries to do that, and I do think people need to inform themselves both in the more standard versions of that and in some alternative versions. So my book, as I said, is trying to provide a revised version, and I think people will do well to inform themselves of different sorts of perspectives. And then I think they need to inform themselves on the current issues. You mentioned uh, issues about the contraception mandate that are going on right now, and there are other such issues. And I think people just need to understand these a little better than than they will if they just listen to normal media accounts. Um, and at that point, they can decide for themselves you know, how they want to come out. These are complicated issues, and I don't pretend otherwise. So they can decide for themselves how they want to come out on the different issues. Um, but at that point, if you, have, if you have knowledgeable voters, I think things will be um, will be better off than um, if we just kind of uh, receive the standard story, which I think nearly all of us do. I mean, my students, they've pretty much been immersed in the standard story. I just think we need to be better informed about that. The author is Stephen Smith. The book is The Rise and Decline of American Religious Freedom. Thanks for listening. This is John J. Miller of National Review Online. Thanks for listening. Our guest is Molly Worthen, author of Apostles of Reason, The Crisis of Authority in American Evangelicalism. Molly, why do American evangelicals have such a bad reputation among secular intellectuals, and do they deserve it? Evangelicals have a, a bad rap, you could say, among the secular intelligentsia because they don't play by the rules of secular intellectual life. Uh, secular intellectual life you know, for the past few hundred years has has not been a free-for-all. Uh, it has clear rules, clear authorities. If you want to participate as a full and respected member, you have to follow the rules of the scientific method. You have to respect the conventions of professional peer review, and these really have to be the way in which you frame and evaluate any argument that you make. But evangelicals, at least some of them, uh, tend to reject these rules because they have different authorities in mind. Now, when people consider uh, the, the so-called anti-intellectualism that you encounter among conservative Protestants, I think they, they have the wrong idea about where, where this comes from. Uh, they think that evangelicals are a bunch of uh, zombies who don't think for themselves, who reside in authoritarian communities in which they follow unthinkingly every word their pastor says, they have one set way of interpreting scripture, and they, they don't even uh, entertain any challenges. And this is entirely wrong. My book suggests that to the extent that evangelicals have a tense, fraught relationship with secular intellectual life, the reason is not authoritarianism. The reason is that they are caught in a kind of crisis of authority that has really defined the evangelical tradition since its origins in the Reformation. Now, quickly, who's an evangelical? How do you define this term? This is a question that is it's very controversial, both among uh, believing Christians themselves and among uh, secular outsiders. Anyone who sets out to study evangelicals has to grapple with it. Most scholars have come up with uh, definitions of an evangelical that really focus on basic points of doctrine, defining as an evangelical a person who uh, believes in the necessity of the born-again experience, a, a very high view of biblical authority, the need to evangelize, things like this. As I got into my research, I kept running up against the limits of those definitions. I found myself as a historian wanting to include as evangelical communities that share common roots in the pietist revivals uh, that follow the, the Reformation in the 17th and 18th centuries. So I decided to define an evangelical not so much in terms of shared doctrines, but in terms of shared questions. I found that the folks that I wanted to include seem to simply be concerned with the same anxieties. They cared about what one another got up to, you could say, even if they disagreed on points of doctrine. So the questions that I found them kind of revolving around 
are first, how do you reconcile faith and reason? Secondly, how do you know Jesus? How do you cultivate an authentic connection with the divine and be certain that you are saved? And third, how do you live out your Christian faith in an increasingly secular and pluralistic public square? These are the questions that I really think make evangelicalism a very modern uh, community, uh, centuries old, but really struggling with uh, uniquely modern issues, and that really unite a very diverse group of of Protestants, even if they disagree on on almost all fundamentals of doctrine besides the the real basics, you know, the divinity of Christ and, and that sort of thing. How do they reconcile faith and reason? Well, different evangelicals have very different approaches to this question, and my book uh, really chronicles the intellectual civil war within American evangelicalism over the past half century. It tries to explain why one particular method of reconciling faith and reason came to exercise disproportionate influence and really characterize the public face of evangelicalism uh, to the exclusion of others. This is you could say, the backstory to the rise of the Christian right. So the, the community that, that really uh, becomes quite, quite dominant is um, a subset of evangelicals that really come out of the Reformed theological tradition. This is the tradition associated with John Calvin and other Swiss and French theologians. And they uh, develop in the 17th century a particular understanding of how you should defend the Bible, how you should think about biblical authority in response to the threats of the time. They're really caught in a bind. Uh, these are 17th century Protestant theologians who are trying to kind of fend off, on the one hand, the uh, atheistic critics of the Enlightenment who are busy undermining uh, all the Bible's truth claims, saying there can't be all these miracles, you know, you really have to respect the rules of of nature as we're uncovering them. And on the other hand, they're trying to grapple with the challenges of the Catholic scholastic theologians who were busy, you know, picking apart Protestant claims in that annoyingly logical fashion that scholastics have. So these reformed theologians came up with a hyper-rationalistic approach to the Bible, in which they basically said the Bible is a science textbook as much as it is a rule for faith and worship. And there is one way of knowing the world. You can't have a gap or an inconsistency between the revelation as we know it in scripture and the revelation as we encounter it in the natural world. This has to be consistent across all times and places, and we have we really can't accommodate these challenges uh, you know, that, that modern scientists and historians are, are bringing to, to scripture. And this, I'm, I'm greatly simplifying a complicated story, but this very scientific, rationalistic approach to the Bible uh, becomes very popular in the, in the American early 20th century context of the battle between fundamentalists and modernists. Now, that said, there are other uh, equally ancient uh, evangelical approaches to Scripture. The Anabaptist tradition, for example, historically never had a highly developed understanding of, of biblical inspiration. They focused instead on the Bible as a rule for practical daily living, and they emphasized uh, the job of the entire community to collectively discern its meaning. The Wesleyan tradition has historically stressed that Christ himself, rather than scripture, is God's true revelation. And to discern the will of God, a Christian must bring scripture into conversation with human reason, uh, personal spiritual experience, church tradition, um, as, well as, as well as the word of, of scripture, allowing for a bit more flexibility. So my point is that these other traditions had built into them a bit of flexibility, a less of a commitment to the Bible as a source of a scientific law, and were, I think, poised to, to grapple in, in perhaps a more moderate, accommodating way with uh, modern science and, and scholarship. Um, but in the context of the fundamentalist modernist crisis and the, the deep sense of, of threat and anxiety about the direction of culture, 
this particular reformed view uh, came to gain really outsized influence, and that becomes even more true after World War II. Molly, we, we keep hearing that the United States is becoming more secular, that we're losing our religion as fewer people go to church. First of all, is this true? And second, if so, does it mean that American evangelicalism has in some sense failed? That's a great question. I, this is something that, that keeps uh, observers of American culture as well as historians up at night, and it's certainly not a settled question. I think it's certainly the case that the authority of all institutions, not just religious institutions, has declined over the past couple of generations. I mean, this is what Robert Putnam is writing about in his book, Bowling Alone. And in this rise of, uh, you know, the, the Internet and social media and people sort of gravitating toward their own uh, private, uh, curated conversations and sources of authority that they can access in their own living room, it's, it is true, I think, that... Uh, the, the clergy of the established organized religions um, in, in the West and in America in particular, uh, their authority is not what it once was. And certainly if we look at the statistics we have, many of the, the great flagship evangelical denominations whose membership numbers were booming for so much of the 20th century, I'm thinking in particular of large denominations like the Southern Baptist Convention and the Assemblies of God, these churches have watched their membership numbers stagnate or decline in North America over the past few years, and they are deeply worried about it. Uh, their only real growth now is abroad, is in the global South. And I see no reason to think that this trend is going to reverse itself. Now, it may slow down, it may come to a kind of equilibrium, but I think that the era of great evangelical expansion in North America is over, at least uh, until we see perhaps um, a, a reversal that might be associated with more and more immigrants coming from uh, cultures that are traditionally quite religious uh, and perhaps repopulating the churches. The reason why the Catholic Church has not suffered the same fate as the liberal mainline denominations that had declined since the 1960s is entirely because of the influx of immigrants, particularly from Latin America, into their pews. Now, you ask then, is, does this mean that evangelicalism has failed? Well, certainly uh, by evangelicals' own traditional standards, that is, baptism rates, they are, they are experiencing a, a trough, uh, a period of, of difficulty, I think, in North America. Uh, but evangelicals themselves, I think, are inclined to take the long view. They are very excited about the success of their missionary efforts abroad, their, their great expansion in Latin America and Africa in particular, and increasingly in Asia. And in this era of globalization and flow, people flow, it's, it's by no means clear that uh, North America won't you know, become home, become a missionary destination for many of these newer, younger Christian churches in, in the centuries to come. And as evangelicals increasingly feel that they are on the losing side of the, the consensus on culture wars issues, such as, such as gay marriage, for example, they look abroad. They, they point out that if we step back and consider the consensus of the global Christian church on some of these issues, evangelicals in America are still comfortably in the majority, and they, they point to, to the authority and the judgment of, of the church as a worldwide community. So I, I don't think that I've, I've yet to meet an evangelical who would say that despite these trends of secularization, they have failed. The author is Molly Worthen. The book is Apostles of Reason, The Crisis of Authority in American Evangelicalism. Thanks for listening. This is John J. Miller of National Review Online. Thanks for listening. Our guest is Jim Garrity, author of The Weed Agency, a comic tale of federal bureaucracy without limits. Jim, The Weed Agency is a novel. What's it about? What's the story you tell? Sure. Um, first, first thing I should emphasize, it is not about marijuana uh, or the DEA. Now, if this ends up with lots of very confused stoners purchasing it, I won't be complaining too much. But uh, It basically began with... Um, uh, an idea from Dana Perino and uh, one of my editors at uh, Crown Forum, Sean Desmond. Uh, now, obviously, NRO listeners and, and fans are 
very dedicated students of government. So they're familiar with the real-life federal interagency working group on uh, the invasive species, uh, which worries about weeds and bugs and critters and all kinds of stuff that could threaten U.S. agriculture. This is a real-life organization, and uh, sad to say it started out in the early Reagan years and has since grown and expanded. And uh, you kind of see the natural metaphor of federal groups whose job is to fight weeds, growing, spreading rapidly, and being very difficult to uh, uproot. So they kind of saw this natural metaphor here of government bureaucracy growing like a weed. Um, and basically they said, could you, come up with a, could you come up with a fictional history uh, of a federal agency whose job is just to fight weeds and how it grows and how it spreads and why it's very difficult for uh, anybody to get rid of a federal program once it gets started? And in the process, could you try to make it funny? And um, once they said, you know, it doesn't have to be uh, – uh, dry and, and dull and everything, it uh, became a lot of fun to do. And, uh, you know, trying to make a point about why government works the way it does, or I guess you could say doesn't work the way it does, um, in, a, in hopefully a funny, fast-moving uh, way, way to tell a story. So you write about this U.S. Department of Agriculture Agency of Invasive Species. Does, does that thing actually exist? Because I know it could. Uh, fake but accurate is the way I'm describing this book, much the way Dan Rather described those memos for uh, George W. Bush back in 2004. Like I said, there's this interagency working group which includes eight or nine different federal agencies, including NASA, by the way. Um, so I guess they're on the lookout for alien space weeds as well. Um, so that is true. And so basically it's kind of created its, its own federal agency um, that I had started back during the uh, Jimmy Carter years. It just seemed like something a peanut farmer would create. Um, and the idea that it starts out as, you know, as, as many conservatives know, today it's a small experimental pilot program, and tomorrow it's this desperately underfunded uh, uh, federal program taking care of people's needs. And so um, while the, the specific agency doesn't exist, I uh, did a lot of research, did a lot of talk to good folks in places like Citizens Against Government Waste and uh, the Pig Book and their kind of stuff, and just talk about how... Uh, a dumb program gets created, you know, your mohair subsidies and things like that, and why it's so impossible to uh, get rid of these things despite the best efforts of, uh, you know, usually some, you know, budget-cutting Republicans and even some Democrats who get frustrated by the way the bureaucracy works. There are characters in this book. One of them is Adam Humphrey, who works at the Agency of Invasive Species. Another is a fellow named Nicholas Bader, who I guess is his uh, arch nemesis, you might say. Anyway, who are, who are these people? Um, they're all kind of amalgamations. I mean, I knew I needed somebody who represented the bureaucracy, somebody to be the voice of bureaucracy, somebody to be kind of the defender of it. And uh, calling him Adam Humphrey was a tip of the hat to uh, the old series Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister over on the BBC, um, which back in the late 70s and early 80s talked a little bit about how uh, how government wor really works and the way it doesn't really work the way it's supposed to. Um, and so at one point, you know, I, I was I originally wanted Humphrey to be like just kind of this like embodied spirit of the bureaucracy. And my editor said, no, he's got to have a backstory. I was like, okay, I'll give him an actual flesh and blood human. Um, but he clearly is the voice of the status quo, the voice of the establishment. The guy kind of thinks that, look, Washington works the way it has to work. Uh, very rarely gets much scrutiny, and that's the way it's supposed to be. Kind of cheerfully cynical about the way he goes about his work. Um, and, and, you know, ultimately kind of the problem, but hopefully kind of a, a charming villain, uh, somebody who you kind of uh, admire the way he manages to get out of trouble, no matter how badly it seems to accumulate. Uh, Nick Botter is kind of um, the Captain Ahab of this story, who's out to get rid of this federal program. It strikes him as the most glaring example, example of... Uh, uh, a, a, a runaway government spending and, and ineffectiveness. Uh, it was kind of interesting. In an early draft, I had written him kind of the way I view government spending as in, you know, kind of as a you know, traditional conservative who's just kind of, uh, this is ridiculous. We should get rid of it. I can't wait to fire these people. Um, and I had some of my non-political friends reading it, and they kept saying, well, why is this guy, Nick Bott, why is he such a nut job? Why is he so obsessed with this? So, it's kind of a useful wake-up call to me uh, that cutting the government may be something that uh, fakes you, know, treat you and I and a lot of NRO readers treat as a, uh, a serious priority. But everybody else kind of seems like this um, kind of strange crusade that we're worried about. So kind of, you know, it was kind of fun to make Botter a guy. Who, he's, not, you know, he's something of a hero, uh, but he does kind of go a little unhinged as the story progresses. Some real people walk on stage in your story as well. Uh, Joe Biden, Newt Gingrich, and, and so forth. 
Yeah, that was kind of fun. Uh, whenever I quote somebody, I try to at least go back to their past comments and quote uh, or paraphrase their similar things. Uh, one of the, you know, uh, uh, another reviewer had said they can't wait to see Newt Gingrich take a look at it because um, Gingrich, you know, it goes through over 30 years of history, and so it includes goes back to the Reagan years, uh, the Bush years, the Clinton years, and the Republican Revolution of '94. And those of us who were around then kind of remember that. Well, this is it. We're going to cut the government. We're going to really, uh, uh, you know, finally make a change around here. And one of the things that uh, you know, one of the lessons of the past 30 years is that it's very hard for a Republican to cut the government and do something else. And most conservatives come to Washington with more than one goal. You know, they wanted to win the Cold War as well. Um, you know, the, the war on terror clearly consumed a good portion of George W. Bush's uh, presidency. So it's very hard to cut the government and do something else. And Newt was a futurist. Newt very much believes in the uh, revolutionary power of technology to change the way government works. Um, and so not to give too much away, but uh, basically Humphrey and his allies are very, very good at figuring out uh, the psychology of members of Congress and what it takes to persuade them and what are the magic words that kind of make them not see them so wasteful. And so basically, uh, Newt's futurist side, his belief that technology can make government work better, kind of overcomes the uh, instinct to cut this program and get rid of it as quickly as possible. Jim, you're, you're a political reporter for National Review. What made you want to write a novel? And I guess what I'm really asking is, is couldn't you have just written an op-ed or a, a piece for National Review magazine? Uh, what, what does fiction allow you to do that you can't do with nonfiction? Sure. Um, one is that book was most enjoyable. And yes, this is a story about government bureaucracy and the way Washington works. But um, one of the parts of the book that I'm most pleased with, and I'm, I'm getting some positive feedback so far, was um, the story of a, a young woman who comes to work for the agency in the early 90s named Ava, who I think kind of represents or, or represents certainly a lot of the folks that I came with. I arrived in Washington in uh, 1993. And they come here with a great deal of idealism. Uh, and, you know, sometimes it, you can be left, right, center, um, but people come to Washington because they care about something that usually seems kind of weird wherever they come from. Uh, could be really concerned about economic issues or abortion or the environment or foreign policy. Um, and they come here to make the world a better place. Uh, they're going to change the world. And sometimes it can be very naive, but I think there's also something kind of noble and um, even inspiring the idealism of the young people who come to Washington year in and year out. They you know, sometimes end up working for places like the National Review, and sometimes they end up working for places like the federal government. And um, most people who work for the federal government are kind of frustrated by the way um, it works. And they, they come here with this energy and this drive and this determination. And basically, the, the federal bureaucracy tells them, we don't want you to really change things too much. We don't really want you to come here with all these new ideas and all this stuff. Most of us here are happy with the way things work. We're going to you know, punch in, punch out until the day we collect our pension. Um, and, and kind of the cynicism takes root in them. And so, um, one, I got to tell that kind of story, which is kind of tough to write in an op-ed. And I guess, it, as I said, this is a story that spans from uh, 81 to Obama's re-election in 2012. You know, and so basically kind of to tell a long-form story, uh, hopefully illuminate something about um, Washington, but also maybe kind of this story that I think a lot of people experience over the course of their careers of coming in with um, vigor and excitement and, and optimism and drive and, and you know, you, you set out to change the world and oftentimes the world changes you. Um, so what do you do when you figure out the world will not change as easily as you think? And uh, all three of our, you know, all, all of my characters kind of confront this, that, you know, the world isn't easy to change, so what do you do then? How do you adjust how you, your, your worldview and, um, you know, kind of it's a little bit about growing up and, and some lessons that I've learned. And I think hopefully a lot of people will kind of see in themselves and, and maybe kind of, you know, help some young people figure out how to, uh, how to drive their careers in a, in a changing world. Last question we have, less than a minute. Jim, you write the Morning Jolt newsletter for National Review. It's emailed out to subscribers. What is the Morning Jolt and how can listeners get it? Sure. Um, just about every publication issues a morning newsletter, and a lot of them kind of regurgitate the same headlines you'll find everywhere else. Uh, I do this all written myself, uh, often late the night before, the morning after. Uh, you can find it on National Review Online forward slash newsletters if uh, uh, it's the easiest way. It is free. You just plug in your email, and it will get start getting sent to you the next day. 
If you are having troubles with delivery, you can email me at jiminturkey at gmail.com. I'll forward it to the powers that be. And uh, look, it's just kind of you know my, my funny take on the news, some excerpts, sometimes a little bit more essay-related. Uh, trying to give you two or three of the biggest stories of the day, what to expect from the day, what's going on in Washington, and um, hopefully start off your day on a cheery, funny note, since uh, Lord knows the world is depressing and frustrating enough as is. The author is Jim Garrity. The book is The Weed Agency, a comic tale of federal bureaucracy without limits. Thanks for listening. This is John J. Miller of National Review Online. Thanks for listening. Our guest, Lawrence Schrod, author of Vodka Politics, Alcohol, Autocracy, and the Secret History of the Russian State. Mark, when we talk about vodka and the Russians, it feels like a joke is on the way. There's a punchline coming. But how important, how really important is vodka to the Russians? I, I think it's tremendously important. It's a very important part of uh, Russian culture and Russian society, but also in terms of its politics and its history. And that's one of the reasons I wrote the book, uh, as I did, is to not to be impolite, but to take seriously this notion that, yeah, there is a stereotype of the drunken Russian uh, that uh, we all sort of know and kind of anticipate that joke coming along the line, uh, but also that there's reasons for that. There's a reason that Russians are drinking 18 liters of pure alcohol per person per year. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with decisions that were made, uh, political and economic decisions that were made uh, hundreds of years ago to make vodka sort of the central pillar of Russian statecraft and make it the central focus of the finances of the uh, Russian autocratic state, not only the Soviet one, uh, but the Russian empire that predated that. So are they drinking vodka because it tastes great, or are they drinking it be out, of, out of despair or, 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 or some other reason? Well, it's definitely not because it tastes good, uh, and this is something that you know even Russians will admit to you that uh, that th there's really no good reason to drink vodka. It doesn't have uh, a nice bouquet like a, a wine. It's not something that you can uh, you know swish around in a glass and, and sip and enjoy the process. Uh, it's all about getting drunk. It's the end result is is what's important. So even a you know a Russian uh, vodka connoisseur will quaff it down and with a with a grimace on his face. Uh, and uh, try to get to the end point, which is is oblivion, which is drunkenness at that point. So, um, and uh, so, I don't think it's because anybody particularly likes it, uh, but it's become part of the culture uh, for a long time uh, because it was the primary beverage that was promoted at uh, the Tsar's taverns going back hundreds of years uh, because it made a lot more money than did the alternatives, did the beers and the wines and so on that, that the state was selling to people. Um, so eventually those things get kind of muscled out and uh, vodka is about all that remains. Has vodka and alcoholism held Russia back? Is, is Russia a weaker or lesser nation today because of vodka? I think definitely. Uh, this is one of the conclusions that I come to in the book is that uh, looking at the demographic toll that uh, vodka has taken on, on, the, on the population. Uh, in fact, there was an, uh, another report that just came out in The Lancet uh, just last week um, highlighting the uh, endemic nature and, and the, the problems that uh, vodka has for, for Russian, uh, Russia's demographic future. Um, and one of the things I conclude in the book is that if you look at population projections, uh, even from the 1980s and 1988, uh, from the old Soviet days, of where Russia would be, the Russian Federation, um, in terms of demographic projections to the year 2050, uh, versus what has happened with this demographic implosion that came about in the 1990s as the Soviet Union collapsed. Um, and we're looking at a difference if, uh, by, by the year 2050, uh, a gap of about 50 to 55 million people that could have been, uh, if you think about economics uh, and economist terms about the, the opportunity costs of vodka. Um, and I think about that as, as a tremendous tragedy. Uh, if it weren't for vodka and uh, you know, killing off a half million people per year, uh, especially since the 1990s, um, Russia could have 55 million more uh, taxpayers, 55 million more healthy people contributing to uh, to the economy and to the arts and to all these other uh, other notions uh, that are out there, um, so that Russia wouldn't have to worry about uh, you know having a uh, a sickly 
uh, conscript army. They could have a professional army if the, you know, were it not for uh, this this gap of 55 million people that that could have been. Um, so I do see it as, as something of a tragedy. I do think that Russia uh, lament, lamentably has been held back due to this uh, this legacy of vodka and vodka politics. How did vodka figure during the Cold War? Oh, there was a uh, during the Cold Soviet years. There was um, uh, a lot of different elements that that came to the fore. Uh, most tellingly for me, I think what there tended to be a very stark, what you might consider to be sort of a wet, dry divide uh, amongst the reformers uh, throughout the Soviet period. So, uh, if you get into the 60s and the 70s, uh, the people who were in power, whether it was, well, I guess, first Stalin, uh, you know, in the 50s, and uh, then uh, Khrushchev, and then especially in, into the Brezhnev years, uh, these guys were drop-dead alcoholics. Uh, and it's not because they were, you know, predisposed to drinking because of their genes or anything like that, but they were part of a system that encouraged drunken excess. Uh, but fascinatingly for me, uh, a lot of the dissident uh, features that were, sh- you know, the, the Solzhenitsyns and the Sakharovs uh, and, and so on, um, who were shouting down the autocracy and trying to highlight the problems with it, were highlighting alcoholism uh, first and foremost. And what I thought was interesting is that these guys tended to be uh, on the drier end of the spectrum in terms of their personal temperaments. Uh, and then even when it comes to once uh, Brezhnev dies in, in the 19, uh, 1982, uh, he's replaced by Yuri Andropov, uh, his, his former head of the KGB, yes, uh, but he was also fairly temperate in his temperament, and one of the th- things that he does initially is institute something of a, an anti-alcohol campaign to boost um, uh, you know, uh, labor productivity and make sure that people aren't slacking off at work. Um, and that gets kind of picked up upon by Mikhail Gorbachev when he comes into power in 1985. Uh, we like to think of him, you know, in retrospect, as this, this great reformer. But the very first thing that he does, his very first great reform, was um, a sweeping anti-alcohol campaign, uh, again to uh, to f- promote um, labor productivity and sort of the moral rejuvenation of of the the Russian state. And so, uh, throughout the Soviet period, I thought it was really fascinating to see that those who were sort of the more conservative, sort of stodgy elements and didn't want to reform the Soviet system tended to drink a whole lot. Uh, and those who really were at sort of the forefront of, of calling down the autocracy and, and pushing for greater reform of the system uh, tended to be teetotalers, or at least uh, abstinent in the, in the most part. So that includes the Solzhenitsyns, the Sakharovs, uh, and even guys like Mikhail Gorbachev. Should, should Americans care about alcoholism in Russia, or like, to put it a different way, should we be secretly delighted that vodka hurts the Russians, or does this does does, does does alcoholism in Russia pose a kind of national security risk for the United States? Um, I don't think it does. Um, I think it's one of these things that it's one of the reasons that I wrote the book is is not to sort of browbeat the the Russians that they've got a, an alcohol problem, but I think it's more to highlight the problems of autocracy in Russia that. Alcoholism in Russia um, isn't a cultural phenomenon necessarily, uh, but it's also a symptom of an autocratic, a system of autocratic rule. And so, if you're interested in, uh, you know, promoting good governance practices in Russia and uh, pushing Russia to become uh, more open, uh, more integrated with the world economy, and more democratic. Uh, that also includes things like you know promoting health reform in Russia and uh, you know highlighting the endemic nature of vodka in sort of holding Russians back um, from what could be uh, a, a greater potential. So I see it as, as not necessarily of an us versus them thing, uh, but more of a uh, you know a symptom of an autocratic system uh, that really needs if it wants to. Uh, I guess modernize and reform and, and be more in line with uh, you know the expectations in the West uh, really has to address that alcohol problem that has been put to bed in, in the United States and a lot of other countries of Western Europe. Last question: We're having this conversation just as the Winter Olympics in Sochi are getting underway. Uh, I know you visited Sochi, and we hear stories about corruption and kickbacks and uh, and uh, and the economics of of the Olympics and so forth. Does vodka make economic corruption in Russia worse, or is it, is it merely a symptom of a corrupt culture? That's a, a great thing that, uh, again, I, I bring up in the book, is, is that if you look at this sort of 
endemic nature of corruption in Russia. It seems to be just as endemic as alcoholism, as it were. Um, that uh, people who look at corruption in Russia today, they say, well, it's all Putin's fault, it's this corrupt system. Uh, others say, well, it was from the lawlessness of the Yeltsin years in the 1990s. Uh, during the Yeltsin years, people said the corruption was due to the old Soviet system, and during the Soviet period, they said the corruption was due to the old uh, vestiges of the uh, capitalist, imperialist past of the, the czar system. And it goes all the way back. And what I found in my research is that if you want to get at where corruption as sort of an instituted system uh, of, of kickbacks and bribery and so on, uh, where that really took hold in Russia uh, was with the alcohol system, with the alcohol tax farm, as it was known, uh, going back uh, even as recently as the, uh, the 19th century, uh, where you had uh, the state was f essentially outsourcing or farming out uh, the collection of vodka revenues to uh, oftentimes very unscrupulous uh, people who would uh, promote alcoholism in their districts to maximize all the revenue that they could. Um, and so in that case, it meant you know, paying kickbacks to the local uh, police, it meant paying kickbacks to local governors, it meant paying kickbacks to uh, law enforcement agents and, and the judiciary and so on. Uh, and this became part of how things were done and how business was done. And, and if you're looking for the roots of corruption in Russia, which we see quite a bit in the case of, of Sochi, um, you know, you have to go back to looking at not only deep history, uh, but also the role that vodka plays in that. The author is Mark Lawrence Schrod. The book is Vodka Politics, Alcohol, Autocracy, and the Secret History of the Russian State. Thanks for listening. Jay Miller of National Review Online. Thanks for listening. Our guest is Hiawatha Bray, author of You Are Here, From the Compass to GPS, The History and Future of How We Find Ourselves. Hiawatha, are we entering an era in which it will be almost impossible to get lost? Well, almost. <laughs> you have to say almost. Two weeks after an entire jumbo jet has gone missing, and I shouldn't even be chuckling because it's a horrifying story, but it's also startling precisely because you would think it would be impossible for something like that to happen nowadays. The reason being that we are indeed now in a world in which it's just about impossible for us as individuals to disappear unless we really want to practically live like hermits. Because uh, increasingly, everything we do is in one way or another being tracked. And one of the most fundamental things that's being tracked is our location. Because location is astonishingly imp important and powerful information. When you know where somebody is, and, and mind you, what I mean is not just knowing where he is at any particular moment, but when you are able to know where that person has been over an extended time, you can practically write the story of a person's life. It's amazing how revealing it is just to be able to track somebody's location, and we're at a point where half the stuff we use in our everyday life is keeping track of where we are, and, and it's only going to get to be more significant. I don't go into this, excuse me, I don't go into this as much as I should have, perhaps, in the book, and I'm thinking about writing another book about this, which is this whole concept of the Internet of Things. Have you heard about that? No. Oh, really? You haven't heard about the buzzword? Oh, you know, if you watch, uh, like, commercials and you see uh, commercials for Cisco, they are calling it the Internet of Everything. And you will hear that buzzword more and more frequently, like it or not. And it refers to a very real, very wonderful, and also very scary phenomenon. It's basically the idea that computing, memory, sensors are all becoming so cheap that we can embed them into anything. Literally anything in the world around us, we could put computers in. And those computers, among other things, will track how people are using all these various objects. And this will be able this, this will enable us to have amazing capabilities. I mean, for example, imagine uh, shoes that uh, not only know how far you've walked, but can tell when you are on the verge of having a stroke. This is at the Consumer Electronics Show in January. There's scientific research, apparently, that indicates that one of the ways you can tell somebody is having a stroke is that there are subtle changes in their gait, their way of walking. And they were demonstrating a sensor that goes into your shoes, and it just keeps track of you. And if you are known to have a prone, if you are considered a high-risk person for stroke, you can get a pair of these shoes or you get sensors and put them into your existing shoes, and the minute you start walking in a way that suggests you're going to have a stroke, an alarm goes off. Actually, what will happen is it will ping your phone, and your phone will ping your doctor. 
This is what I'm talking about. You're going to see stuff like that in practically everything. I'm sure you've heard about the tennis rackets that tell you if you're swinging them properly, the toothbrush that tells you if you're brushing your teeth properly. Have you heard about those? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I, I, I'm just glad when I remember to floss. <laughs> you go, yeah, I know. What's a the like flossing? I, I, I find it funny. No, but seriously, right down the line, think of anything you can think of. It's really coming to this point. Literally anything you can think of could have these kinds of technologies embedded in them. So this is this, this, these these technologies are amazing. What what are the ramifications for privacy? If if we live in a world where where we, where we can't get lost or where it's almost impossible to get lost, will we be able to hide? Well, that's exactly one of the problems. And it, it's weird because it need not necessarily be that way if we think this through. Perfect example is a case of a technology. I talk about this in my book. A technology where we didn't think it through, which was. Uh, the Easy Pass system. Do you have an Easy Pass, by any chance? I don't know. Do you no, drive... I know. I know what it is. Right, exactly. I don't drive on toll roads that much myself, but my wife occasionally does. So she has an Easy Pass, and it's the device that lets you drive right through the booth because it's transmitting a radio signal. It actually works a lot like the transponder on on, on airplanes. It sends and they send out a signal, and the pass pings back. Well, it's very simple, really. They designed it so that when it pings back, among other things. It tells you, here, this is car number XYZ, and we can then go back and figure out whose car this is. They didn't have to design it that way. They could have designed an easy pass system to be anonymous so that you would pay the toll but not reveal your identity while you were doing it. They would know somebody was at that location, but they wouldn't know who. But they never even thought about it. And now police, divorce lawyers, all kinds of people routinely use this location information for criminal investigations, civil investigations, and you go, oh, well, that's good, that's wonderful. Yeah, but what if you work? In, what if you live in a uh, society where you don't want the government to know where you are? And, and this is just the beginning. There's something else I talk about in my book. Have you heard about license plate readers? Yes. Explain what that, they are. Oh, it's really just very basic, simple stuff. You're basically taking video, today, video camera technology, and you're mounting uh, a camera onto a lamp post or onto a police car. And it simply takes pictures of every license plate of every car that goes past a particular location. And it, now, might mean, it, might, it might mean the cars will never be stolen again. Uh, well, I don't know if it necessarily guarantees that. Although, by the way, car theft is way down in the United States. Uh, car theft has become much less common than it used to be because the technology of securing cars really is a lot better. So, it, it, I don't know, maybe it will have a, a further... I, I, suppose, I suppose the criminals will always try and stay one step ahead of the technology, but, but this, is a, this, is, this is, on the one hand, a, a, a really tremendous public safety offering. Oh, no, but... Oh, 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 all right, all right. Now, first, two things. First of all, let us suppose you live in a community where the cops have these all over the place, and they store the records permanently. They now know every place you've ever driven. They know where you've been. And at any point, they could just go on fishing expeditions through these records and figure out where any given person has driven or any time, say, over the last five years. Do we really think the police should have that much uh, of a power over our, uh, our location? And secondly... Uh, I'm on paper. I, I, I don't know. Did you mention that I'm a reporter for the Boston Globe? I got mentioned that. I'm a reporter for the Boston Globe. A couple of weeks ago, front page story. I didn't do it. Private companies are using these even more than police agencies. Private organizations that do things like, uh, you know, uh, just collecting information for things like repossessing autos and stuff like that, are keeping these massive databases of license plates. They keep track of where people have been, where they have driven. This is becoming big business in the United States. And even if you say to the police organization, you can't do it, they can turn around and buy that information from private companies that are selling it. It's like it's similar to what's going on with the whole NSA scandal. You know, you have people worried about what Google is doing. It's not just that the government is spying on us. The private companies are doing it for entirely different reasons, commercial reasons. But then the government comes along and says, you must give us all the data you've collected. And Google says, wait a minute, we didn't collect this data so you could use it to spy on people. They say, we don't care, we've got a court order, give it to us. And, and so all this information being collected about us, including where we are, because a lot of what Google collects is where you are, is going to be uh, available to the police even when the police didn't originally collect it. And it's going to get to be a mess. So what should lawmakers do right now? 
uh, assuming they can even keep up with the technology and, and, and do something sensible. Is there something, for example, Congress ought to be thinking about right now as we enter this uh, brave new world of, 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 of never being lost and always being found? Well, one thing I think we're going to need is some kind of national privacy standards, which we do not have. Other companies, other countries rather, as for example, Germany is really making out really nicely in, all, in the aftermath of all these NSA regulations because Germany has famously tough privacy laws. And there are actually, if you go on the internet now, you hear people saying, our servers are based in Germany, so you can do online business with us because we can't do stuff to you. And uh, we may have to move in the same direction and have a federal law that sets standards for what private companies as well as police agencies can and cannot keep in terms of information about people. If you collect the location information, for example, and nobody said you shouldn't be able to, but maybe there have to be very strict limits on how long you can keep it. Uh, very high limits on, well, we already have the case of U.S. versus Jones. You know about that, right? Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't know, in case people don't know, U.S. versus Jones was the uh, Supreme Court ruling that held that if you wanted to t attach a GPS to somebody's car, you had to get a warrant. Well, we may have to do the same sort of thing where they say if you want to collect uh, somebody's location for a very limited amount of time, you might not need a warrant. But if you want to collect it for, say, more than a week, you've got to get a full fledged warrant like you need to get a wiretap. Things like that. That's the kind of thing we're going to have to do because we're not going to stop the technology and we're not going to want to. It's a shame, but in the middle of all this we're talking about, we may have lost sight of the fact that in most respects, this is wonderful. <laughs> it's just so cool because we can track ourselves and we can track everything in the world around us with a precision, with an accuracy that was never possible before. We really live in a time that has largely solved that problem. We can actually identify locations of people and of things with, with amazing, amazing precision. And I just love it personally. The author is Hiawatha Bray. The book is You Are Here. From the Compass to GPS, the History and Future of How We Find Ourselves. Thanks for listening. This is John J. Miller of National Review Online. Thanks for listening. Our guest is Clark M. Neely III, author of Terms of Engagement, How Our Courts Should Enforce the Constitution's Promise of Limited Government. Clark, what are the courts doing wrong today? They're not even making a sincere effort to judge the constitutionality of the government's conduct in a wide variety of cases. What we have today is two kinds of judging. We have real judging for constitutional rights and constitutional limits that the courts consider to be important, and we have fake judging or make-believe judging for everything else, and it's intolerable. Now, what does that mean? What, 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 what is the difference between these, uh, these, these two approaches? Well, real judging involves a genuine quest for the truth on the basis of real evidence uh, and, and with some attempt to make sure the government has actually made an effort to tailor its regulations to the harm or issue that it's trying to regulate. That's real judging or what we call in the book judicial engagement. Fake judging is the opposite of that. Fake judging often goes under the banner of something called rational basis review. And with fake judging, there's no effort to determine the truth of the situation. In other words, why the government is regulating the conduct. Evidence doesn't matter because judges will simply hypothesize facts for which the government has no evidence. And in fact, in rational basis cases, judges are required to help the government win by making up justifications for whatever law is being challenged. That's not real judging, that's fake judging. And so another word for it would be judicial abdication. And that's a very stark contrast, and both of those things are going on in our courts today. Now, judicial engagement, that term, sounds a little bit like judicial activism. Are you saying judicial activism is a good thing? I'm not. Judicial activism is a bad thing. Judicial activism is when judges simply make up uh, things that are not in the Constitution. That's not in any way uh, what I'm advocating for or what anybody I know is advocating for. What, what judicial engagement is, is making a genuine and serious effort to evaluate the constitutionality of the government's conduct on the basis of truth and facts. And I'll give you one example where that's not happening. That is not happening in the area of federalism. This is the idea that the Constitution gives the federal government only specific enumerated powers. Judges have been engaging in fake make-believe judging in this area for more than 75 years, and the most glaring example in recent memory, of course, is upholding the Affordable Care Act, a.k.a. AKA Obamacare. That was not an example of real judging. That was an example of judges bending over backwards to say yes to government, as they so often do today. 
So you're critical of, of judicial activism, but you're also a critic in this book of judicial restraint. Uh, what's wrong with judicial restraint? Well, you know, in the abstract, there's nothing wrong with judicial restraint if it simply means, you know, not making things up. But really, judicial restraint has come to be a code word for judi judges doing nothing. In other words, I think of it more as knee-jerk restraint or reflexive deference to the other branches, where unfortunately in all too many cases it seems that judges start out with the end product in mind, which is I am going to uphold whatever the government is doing, and then reason backwards from there. I shouldn't even call it reasoning. They work backwards from there to come up with a rationalization. That, unfortunately, is the kind of judicial restraint that we are seeing more and more today, and it is the kind of judicial restraint that was reflected reflected in the Obamacare decision where they upheld it on the preposterous idea that the government was, was exercising its tax power under the Constitution, which of course it was not. Conservatives, of course, have, have criticized the courts for judicial activism and have called for judicial restraint. They've, they've, they've promoted this idea, they've celebrated this idea, they say we need more judicial restraint. Is that a mistake? It's been a tragic mistake. Uh, if you want to know what judicial, what, what restraint, deference, and modesty means, go and look at Chief Justice Roberts' confirmation hearing. And he pledged restraint, deference, and modesty throughout his hearings. He assured the Senate Judiciary Committee that he was a modest judge. If you want to know what that looks like in real life, just look at his opinion in the Obamacare decision, because he promised restraint, deference, and modesty, and boy, did he deliver in the Obamacare decision. And we're suffering from that right now. The Obamacare decision is a rolling train wreck, and, but it's just emblematic of the federal government for the past 75 years getting into things it has no business doing and taking on responsibilities it is incompetent to discharge. That has been a disaster for this country, and that's just federalism. The same thing plays out with economic economic liberty, property rights, and any number of other areas where we have no meaningful constitutional restraints because judges won't enforce them. Now, conservatives, of course, would say, but, but the courts are, are way too active on certain issues like, say, abortion rights or, or gay marriage, where, where there has been judicial activism, they would say, and legislating from, from, from the bench. Has that actually happened and and is that is that is that created a kind of distraction that has hurt conservatives in other areas as they pursue limits on government there certainly there are areas where judges have have been overly creative uh you know in 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 interpreting the constitution but if you look at it in a larger sense could it really be the case that the biggest problem that we have in this country today is judges saying no to government too often? That is preposterous. The biggest problem we have in the country today, in my judgment, is judges don't say no to government nearly as often as the Constitution says no to government. There is only one branch that is charged with enforcing constitutional limits on government power. It is the judiciary, and they are asleep at the bench. Now, you have some data in this book on how rarely the courts strike down laws. Right, right. And uh, I, I mean, people find it shocking. But between 1954 and 2002, Congress enacted 15,817 laws, of which the Supreme Court struck down just 103. That's two-thirds of 1%. An even smaller percentage of federal regulations have been struck down, and a minuscule percentage of state laws have been struck down. The idea that the government hits the constitutional strike zone 99.5% of the time is absurd. And yet we have the Supreme Court rubber stamping virtually everything the government does in areas from federalism to economic liberty to tax policy to even the kind of medical care you can seek when you're ill. Uh, it's just not plausible that the government gets it right 99% of the time, and courts shouldn't act as if it does. Well, sometimes you see legislators saying things like, well, we'll pass this law, and then we'll let the courts decide if it's constitutional, which is a kind of abdication of their own responsibility, but also an invitation almost to the courts to strike down laws. Yeah, unfortunately, it hasn't worked that way. Instead, what we've gotten is a kind of a death spiral of buck-passing and finger-pointing. So what happens is legislators will say, well, you know, who are we to say whether this is constitutional? We're not really trained to do that, and frankly, they're right. They're not very good at that kind of thing. 
but then it gets kicked over the judiciary, and the judiciary says, well, you know, it's the legislature that really is also charged with deciding what's constitutional, and it's not for us to just go around striking things down willy-nilly, and, and besides, if this is a really bad or unconstitutional law, uh, you know, the, the political process will straighten it out eventually, so it's really not our job to do this either. And what ends up happening is it turns out to be nobody's job, uh, or at least nobody's willing to do the job of, of subjecting uh, freedom-restricting laws to rigorous constitutional constitutional scrutiny. In vast areas of constitutional law, that is simply not happening anymore in this country, and it has been a travesty. Last question. Clark, you are a senior attorney at the Institute for Justice. What is the Institute for Justice? And, and give us an example of the sort of case you guys litigate, because your book is actually full of these kinds of stories. And we haven't talked about them much, but, but what is IJ, and, and what is the type of case you guys uh, take on? The Institute for Justice is a libertarian public interest law firm. In fact, we are the premier libertarian public interest law firm in the country, and we take on uh, uh, issues in four different areas, economic liberty, property rights, free speech, and school choice. And a paradigmatic case that many people have heard of was the Kilo v. City of New London case, where we challenged the use of eminent domain to take private property, bulldoze an entire working class neighborhood, and simply give it uh, to a private property developer to put up nicer houses. We did not believe that was a proper exercise uh, of power under the Constitution, but unfortunately the Supreme Court 5 to 4 rubber stamped it and allowed uh, the use of eminent domain uh, for private ends. And so that's an example of the kind of cases that we litigate. We also do right to earn a living cases, which is mostly what I focus on. Uh, and as I said, school choice and free speech, including campaign finance and getting those laws struck down. So we work in four different areas. Uh, we've had a wonderful track record, been to the Supreme Court five times, and we're hoping to go again. The author is Clark M. Neely III. The book is Terms of Engagement, How Our Courts Should Enforce the Constitution's Promise of Limited Government. Thanks for listening.